America, in particular the good people of Pennsylvania. I'm Richard Eccles, the chairman of the Castle Rye Charitable Trust. 26 years ago, we formed this trust to preserve this dangerous ruin for posterity so that people could come and sit here and visit and be amongst their ancient cultural heritage. Hi, my name is Doug and I'm the project manager for Castle Roy. Behind me you can see Castle Roy, which is an ancient ruin. It's a scheduled monument, which means it's protected by Historic Environment Scotland. It's actually owned by Castle Roy Trust, which is a community trust based in Nessie Bridge, a small village in the Cairngorm National Park in the Highlands of Scotland. So what we'll do today is I'll give you a tour of the castle inside and out, just a brief one, and we'll talk about the consolidation works that we've been carrying out for the last 10 years. It's important to use the word consolidation because we're not restoring the castle. To restore the castle would lose a lot of its uh, historic identity. And it is a scheduled monument, which means it's of national importance to the country and has to be preserved. So that's the important word, which is consolidation. So we'll move on now and I'll show you the various aspects of the castle. So here we are at the here we are at the north uh, wall of the castle. This is actually uh, the tower, and behind me you can see the main entrance, and we'll be going into the castle uh, later on. I, I brought you here because I'd like to show you some of the consolidation work that we've been doing. That's very important to the preservation of the fabric of the castle. You can just see the small outcrop here, um, which denotes the, the tower, the wall of the castle running into the tower, and you'll see these granite coin stones have been put in place. Now, originally, we believe that the coin stones of the castle were roughly tooled red sandstone. Now, the nearest red sandstone to this area is about 35 miles away on the coast. Um, now, medieval times, bearing in mind that the castle's 800 plus years old, very difficult to move large amounts of stone and also very difficult to tool them without machinery, only hand tools, very labor intensive. So over the 800 years of the history of the castle, the local villagers or, or other, other people living nearby have decided the simplest way to get tooled stone was to steal them from Castle Roy and uh, use them in their own buildings. I imagine this would probably have died out when the railways came to Nessie Bridge and it was easier to get uh, large quantities of tooled stone brought on the railways. But uh, historically, that's what happened. Every single coin stone from the castle was removed. The one thing we did have left was the pockets that showed clearly the size and the position of the stone. So in agreement with Historic Environment Scotland, who are the controlling authority to preserve these scheduled monuments, we got permission to reinstate these coin stones that bind the section of the walls together that stops them separating and the castle collapsing. And this is what we've chosen to do. We've used granite. Granite wasn't really a feature of the castle um, originally, the stonework. And we used the, the, the granite because it's easily distinguishable from the original schist type stone and alluvial stone. So although it's still roughly tooled, you can see that this was not part of the original fabric for the castle. And that was one of the conditions that Historic Environment Scotland wanted. We can put things back into the castle stonework wise, but you must be able to differentiate between the ancient and the new additions. But this is now this is now formed a solid structure, and this will prevent this section of the wall from and tower from falling down. You can see over on the end there, we've also gone up to a certain height. Unfortunately, we weren't allowed to go any higher than that. But that's that's bound that 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 bottom section of those two walls together. Up at the top there, you can see the remains of what was a window in the tower, 
we've managed to replace the lintel above that so you could see the formation of the window but we're not allowed to go any higher um, due to the current consent that we have from uh, historic environment Hello, scholars. Eric. This is me with my sons Angus and Mackie. We live in the village locally and I work here as a family doctor. We play in lots of music groups around the place. Um, I'm the leader of the Cairngorms Orchestra, which was started a couple of years ago. I also play in Highland Chamber Orchestra and further field with the European, Med European Doctors Orchestra. So this is the northeastern corner of the castle. Um, you can see where we've done a lot of remedial work here. These were large voids within the wall where the stonework had fallen out and left a huge undercut, which could cause the upper section of the walls to collapse downwards and then we'd lose large sections of the castle. You can you can see the freshness of the stone and the mortar compared with the other side. You can see where the break is. I'll show you old original 800 year old masonry, new 10 year old masonry um, put in place to fill this huge void. The coursing, the coursing of the stone, which is the way it's built, built in courses. The coursing of the stone has followed closely the original coursing. We've also used lime mortar, hydraulic lime mortar, which is exactly what they would have used 800 years ago. They just wouldn't have had the benefit of a cement mixer and lorries bringing sand. But it's the same stuff. It's not like Portland, Portland cement, Portland mortar, which doesn't compress, doesn't move. Um, is is basically harder than the stone and any settlement in the building causes the stone to crack and move and, and, and damage the actual fabric of the building. What the, the hydraulic lime mortar allows a, a small amount of movement so as the building expands and contracts in the heat and the frost and the highland winters that we have, the severe winters, the walls, the walls are allowed to move slightly. The and, and that preserves the structural fabric of these walls. Um, they're very, very important when restoring or consolidating 
ancient buildings like this to use the same material that was used by the ancient masons and laborers that, that built these old fortifications. What we have at the bottom here is we have a, a batter. You can see it possibly around the side here. And this was designed, we've, we've rebuilt this, but this was designed into the building by those, those ancient masons. And what that helped to do was shed water away from the wall. The waters would run down the wall and then be shed off by this buttress. It obviously helps to uh, reinforce the, the, the base of the wall, but it also sheds water. This is all was this all was a, a huge void, underburrowed by rabbits and just general erosion, and this magnificent five foot, six foot in places stone wall was in danger of collapsing in on itself because these areas were missing. And this had been put back in place, coursing hydraulic lime mortar and built back up to match um, and support the, the top masonry. If you can look at, at eye level and follow the line of this wall, you can see how perfectly straight it is. This wall was built between 1195, early 1200s, 1205, 1210, it's it sat here for over 800 years and is perfectly flush, perfectly straight from top to bottom, end to end, which is a testimony of the, those masons who built this without the aid of any, any, any machinery, all the heavy lifting done by hand, huge boulders, huge boulders at the top of it. If you come round, and we look up, you can see amazingly some of the largest stones that have been used are at the highest parts of the wall. And this is what stood island winters, highland storms, gale force, temperatures in the minus 20s. And there it is, untouched above the lower section. The rest of this wall is completely untouched for over 800 years, which is magnificent.
now do is we'll move on to the far side of the castle which is where the probably the most interesting architectural features are to be found. As I said we'll go on to the the most interesting archaeological features of the castle but just while we're passing the southeast corner uh, I wanted to show you this um, this breach and this may not be particularly interesting in itself because it's just a big hole with a fence there to stop people coming into this part of the castle because it's relatively uh, unstable. Um, this is some of the work we've been doing just to stabilise uh, the base section of the, of the breach here. Two thoughts on the breach. One, they maybe decided to put another tower here. Um, so they smashed the corner out of the castle and they're going to build a tower. However, there's no there's no rubble, there's no real um, remnants of the the corner of the castle, and what I believe this to be is a breach, um, a slight created deliberately to weaken the fortification so that it could no longer be used um, as a stronghold. Probably during the, the Scottish Wars of Independence, Robert the Bruce um, he was fairly active in this area. The clan Cumming occupied the castle at that time. They were uh, in allegiance with uh, Bruce's enemies, the Balliols, and um, he took this castle and then smashed the corner out of it, um, as he did with many of his opponent's castles. He was fighting a guerrilla war. He was unable to uh, occupy these castles, but he didn't want them to become um, reoccupied by his enemies. So that's what I believe this hole is. Um, not interesting in itself as a whole, but interesting because uh, I think Robert the Bruce did it. Robert the Bruce went on to become uh, King of Scotland. This is architecturally the most interesting part of the castle because, believe it or not, this is actually the, the indoor toilet. They did have indoor plumbing, although that's a fairly loose term for it. But this was the garderobe, the toilet, the chute area of the castle. Up here, you can see the hole. Um, the walls went considerably above that. There was a passageway between the walls, and this was accessed from both sides. The Laird's Hall on the other side, which is really just a wooden lean-to two-storey building, the Laird would have had access to come and use this facility, and also from what would have been the walkway, the guard area, they could also access this chamber from the other side. There would have been more of an outcrop here, would have been much higher, and this was the, uh, the toilet facilities for the castle. There was also one here within its own chamber, on the inside of the castle. These are actually breaches where the, um, the stonework has fallen out, but um, the, this would have been solid, and inside is a, a chamber, a mural chamber. Um, now, this is currently supported by lime-filled sandbags, scaffolding, and various other props, because it's incredibly flat, fragile and could collapse. Um, uh, one of the things that we're going to be undertaking is to consolidate and make this safe um, to protect it into the future. Um, 
but at the moment it's, it's very fragile and it's a complex process to work out exactly what the structure is, the archaeology around it, um, and this is going to take a considerable amount of time, but is the most advanced section of the castle. If you look over there, you can see um, you can see the other advanced part of the castle, which is the tower. We were around the other side of that earlier on, on the north side, and um, this is uh, the other side of that, which is uh, the tower. We'll go up the tower shortly, and we'll we'll have a look at that. Um, but this is the uh, garderobe area, and a very complex area that we're going to have to work. Moving on, we've now come back into the north end of the castle. We're now at the northwest side of the castle, tower behind me. And this is the remains of what would have been the sally port. This would have been a small arch with a very secure door to allow pedestrian movement predominantly in and out. Um, and that would mean they didn't have to open the main front gates to the castle, um, which would have left them more vulnerable. Um, you can see this has collapsed quite extensively um, around the supports with permission to build this up. Um, you can see again where we've done a lot of infill on the outside. You can see the different coloured mortar to distinguish it from the original. Put a lot of stone back in here. And the same with the, uh, the side of the uh, side of the tower. A huge amount of stone back in there. This had this had great big cracks and voids in it you could virtually walk through and we've put all of this uh, all of this stone back in and consolidated it so if we go into the main body of the castle now you can see over on the north wall we've consolidated the lower part of that that's all finished now, um, to the extent that we've been able to put a pedestrian uh, staircase in that will take you up to the uh, first floor of the tower, where you can uh, enjoy the views from the castle and look a little bit more closely at uh, some of the work we've done.
be able to see the internal courtyard of the castle. The large mound covered in weeds at the moment is the topsoil from inside the castle, which will eventually be put down once we've finished the consolidation work. And in much of the walls, you'll be able to see the lighter coloured mortar, which shows where we've done extensive works in the upper areas of the walls. And then behind me, we've we put the new floor in the tower. This was the original first floor height. We've pocketed it into the, using the joists, into the original pockets. We've rebuilt the missing mortar. Um, we put the lintel on the window. This is called rough racking, this area here. This is predominantly where there's been a large void and we've pushed stones relatively roughly following a rough coursing pattern to consolidate this. But we didn't know exactly how this corner section of the tower looked. For all I know, um, it may well have just been breached through the existing wall and the tower built on, and maybe this is how it's always looked. So we can't recreate something that we don't know the history and the uh, the correct architecture. So this is the rough rack. Um, keeps the moisture out. Hello everybody, my name is Hamish Stone and I'll be playing with Pipes for you tonight. I'm also a stonemason and builder of trade and on your right hand side over there is some of the work I've done in the castle over the years. Uh, I last worked here a few years ago. I've lived in the village all my life and I absolutely love it here and I can't wait for all the new people to be, come over, be able to come over and experience what we have in our Here we are, main arch, main entrance way to the castle, full height, Norman style mm -hmm. arch. Castle. Oh, it's still early early Norman period. Normans came to England 1066, moved up to Scotland over a hundred year period. Um, the Norman earls made friends with the Scottish king, or rather he made friends with them because he didn't want to be invaded, gave them land. They started to build castles, consolidate their power base. And this is a, a rudimentary form of Norman architecture, not as advanced as you see in other areas. Um, of Scotland and um, more so England, but but uh, um, an interesting structure and probably the most interesting feature of this castle is not anything you can see directly. It's the fact that, as I've said already, it was built over 800 years ago and it has been untouched since. Many castles go on to be added to over the years, over the centuries, they expand, they have modern additions. This castle is as it was built. 800 and odd years ago, this is how it looked without the, without the bits that have fallen down. But this is how it looked. And then it was abandoned relatively soon after it was built. Within a few hundred years, it, it became surplus to requirements. And it sat in this little village on top of a hill untouched ever since, which is the most magnificent thing I believe about the castle. It has a sense of presence about it. Nobody's messed about with it. And uh, it's as original as, as the day that those ancient masons put one stone on top of another. So the arch, main entrance in and out the castle, they could bring horse-drawn wagons, horses, knights, could come in and out, secure doors, um, you can see we've lost a lot of the the upper area. There's a thin wall. It would have been more of a goalpost, goalpost to above my height, um, square doors, and then the arch infilled above. Simple way to build an arch. You didn't need to put a huge amount of weight in it. You could build a high-pitched Norman arch and then infill it with a small uh, thin wall. We've got permission to um, to redo some of it, not all of it. I would like to try and put more of a complete arch in, but um, we can certainly put quite a bit of the stonework in to try and support this structure, stop any further deterioration. So we'll go down to the other end of the castle, the southern end on the inside of the courtyard, and we'll have a look down there.
So southern end of the castle. This is basically where the uh, Laird's lean-to hall would have been, albeit it would be a wooden structure attached to the attached to the wall. It's in the whole courtyard. Um, there wouldn't have been any permanent stone structures, just wooden structures, stabling, all other covered areas. Up there, we're not at the full height of the castle, probably another 10 feet above that. So that would have been a, a window in the wall of the castle. It has a step up for an archer um, to uh, to fire down on anybody um, anybody uh, approaching the castle. If you look over on the far side, you'll see another one. This this wall um, is, is 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 probably closer to the height, although it's still lost probably five or six feet, but it's closer to the actual height the castle would have been, uh, with a walkway, I believe, a walkway along the top. And you can see what would have been um, another window at that height and probably a two-story building against that wall. Behind me is the other side of the guard room, which we looked at when we were outside. You can see that this is the mural chamber inside. There would have been a chute going out and this would have been a, a, lower, a lower lavatory. You can see where the inner part of the wall has completely fallen away. That upper archway is really unsupported now and it's going to require um, a lot of work to consolidate. A very, very fragile area um, and we're going to have to be very careful with how we, uh, how we work on that. So um, the last thing I'd like to show you is um, I'm going to go up this ladder here and I'm going to show you um, the upper garden robe and also the small intramural passageway, the small passageway between two walls, which for such a small castle is actually quite sophisticated. And um, I'll show you that. So here we are up on the top of the wall. You can see the surrounding areas and the Cairngorms in the distance there. And uh, this is what I was talking about. This is the, uh, the what we call intramural passageway. You can see small outer wall, small outer wall on that side, and then a passageway through the middle of that. I'm filming this myself now because my camera lady doesn't like heights. And here we have the actual garderobe itself. There's the chute. Um, it goes down and into the outside. If you look very carefully in there, you can see a sloped stone. That stone's been sloped to obviously help whatever been deposited in the hole to go in the right direction. And uh, this is a dividing wall that ran across the middle. So if you can imagine a stone across here, and this side was for the people who wanted to use it from this side of the castle and this side was the laird side that was accessed from the laird's tower and he would come along this little passage and little tiny steps down into this area here that would have come directly out directly out um, of his hallway and he would have he would have walked up the steps, round the corner, and done whatever he needed to do down the chute. A wall here, and I, I imagine that this was really an access, an access route, more steps down here, an access route for those on the outside of the castle who needed to come in and uh, use, use the facilities. So I hope you found that interesting, not too boring. Um, I find it fascinating. You have to really be at the castle to experience the real presence that it has. You feel this great weight of history when you're in a building like this. And it's such a beautiful area, absolutely stunning area the old 17th century church can go beyond that so i hope we found you interesting hope we found it interesting 
and you can find uh, more about the castle on the website castle roy trust and um, really you can actually contribute if you feel like doing so to help us uh, carry out the consolidation works but i would suggest if you're ever in the area beautiful little village in essie bridge you come and pay us a visit and i'll be happy to show you around the castle hi i'd like to introduce you to murdo the guardian of castle roy He's a six-year-old Highland Sturk, otherwise known as a steer, and he joined us in November of 2017. As he was hand-reared, like all Highland cows, they're a docile and gentle breed and easy to manoeuvre and handle. Every family would have had a cow for meat, hide and milk, and then there would have been a bull that would have been shared between the clans. Murder enjoys free rain at the castle, especially in the winter, when he gets to raise the mound and truly be king of the castle. You can find out more about Murdo on the Castle Roy website or on Facebook. We're very lucky to have people who sponsor him and help with his cost. There are lots of pictures. Please enjoy. Thank you. Good folk of Pennsylvania, it's Richard back again. Less my kilt and broadsword. Yesterday I had hoped to give you the whole of my talk using the castle as a backdrop. Unfortunately, the windy weather meant that uh, I was unable to do recording uh, which you could hear. Apart from my introduction where I talked about um, the Castle Roy Trust and Sir Alistair Cummin and Sir James Grant. So if I continue today with um, the castle, which was built by the very powerful clan Cummin 820 years ago. It's situated at the heart of the Spay, Stras Bay um, and was the first of a string of forts set up um, by the Cummins that dominated the whole of the Spay Valley region, as well as the communications north and south. The construction is actually that of a fortress. Four massive stone walls, 25 feet high and five feet thick, with a tower in the corner, a small side entrance here that was used on a daily basis, and the main entrance here, which would only have been opened when the chieftain or supply wagons arrived. The commons went on to build more sophisticated fortresses, um, in particular two of them, Loch and Aileen and Loch and Daub, were built on islands in the centre of lakes and were much easier to defend. Okay, a little bit about the clans, in particular Clan Cummin. In 1306, having dominated the area uh, for a couple of hundred years, Clan Common was decimated by the dastardly betrayer uh, Robert the Bruce, who killed John Cummin at Greyfriars Church. Interestingly, the Bruces didn't last long in this area. Castle Roy then changed hands many times um, until it became, officially became, the, into the fiefdom of the Grants. The Grants went on to be one of the most powerful and richest families, richest families in Britain. The Earl of Seafield, who was a Grant, actually had the town of grant on en spey constructed during a time of famine to give uh, the local workforce uh, labour and payment. The town became a centre of commerce um, with blacksmiths and bakers and churches um, and it remains a small centre of commerce for this region to this day. Now then, before you all rush to the history books, there is very little written evidence of the castle. Why, you might ask? 
Well, Alexander Stuart, better known as the Wolf of Badenoch, had constant arguments with the bishop at Elgin. They were arguing over who should collect taxes in which areas. Well, it all came to a head when the bishop wrote to the wolf and told him to get back to his wife, who had deserted him 20 years before. He obviously caught the wolf on a bad day. Uh, the wolf said to his chief of staff, gather the clan. The clan was gathered and the wolf rode north to Elgin Cathedral and burnt it down. Unfortunately, all the records for the area were kept by the priests and monks and it was centralised in the cathedral. When the cathedral burnt, so did the records, hence we have no written evidence of those early years of Castle Roy or in fact the whole area. A little of the history. Uh, the area is steeped in history with armies marching north and south up and down the Spey Valley. Just to the north, less than five miles away, was the Battle of Cromdale in 1690, where the first Jacobite rebellion um, was crushed when the Jacobites were surprised by government troops and were slaughtered. No surprise there. Um, to the south, the remnants of Bonnie Prince Charlie's army which had been slaughtered at Culloden, gathered at Ruthven Barracks, which was built on the site of another come-in fortress. Here, the bedraggled remnants of Bonnie Prince Charlie's army were uh, told to disperse and save themselves. If you would like to find out more of our history, please look at the history pages at castleroy.org.uk. Before I sum up, let me just show you the interior of the castle and how an artist's impression, using Historic Environment Scotland's ideas, show wooden thatched uh, houses, lean-tos on the inside. The Chieftain's Lodge, which would have been two storeys, and then single storey stables, storerooms and living quarters for the people who served uh, those who lived in the castle. I would like to thank all of you who have helped put together this Peace for Your Americana Fest. They have given their time freely to help promote the castle and raise the funds needed to finish the reconstruction. Also a great big thank you to Dave Klein, with whom I skied this past winter and who has given me the opportunity to participate in this wonderful festival. If anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me through Facebook or via our website, castleroy.org.uk. Finally, may God bless you all.
Many of you might be wondering what a Scotsman wears under his kilt. And now you know.